Welcome to the Effortless English Show with the world's number one English teacher, A.J. Hogue, where A.J.'s more than 40 million students worldwide finally learn English once and for all without the boring textbooks, classrooms, and grammar drills. Here's A.J. with a quick piece to help you learn to speak fluent English effortlessly. I'm A.J. Hogue, the author of Effortless English, Learn to Speak English Like a Native. I train you to speak English fluently. You speak English effortlessly. You speak English confidently. You think in English. When you train with my VIP program, you train, you commit to my VIP program, you commit and don't quit at EffortlessEnglishClub.com. Go there, join and commit to my VIP program at EffortlessEnglishClub.com. And remember, Effortless English VIP members, you also get the movie lessons. You get our movie club lessons, the recordings of the movie club lessons. VIP members, you'll get them all. So another reason to join and commit to the VIP program. Our topic today, learn English with stories, another story from Aesop's Fables, and quite a famous idiom, very, very, very common idiom, look before you leap. So again, we see that so many common idioms in English and other languages too come from Aesop's fables. And this is certainly a very, very, very common one. Look before you leap. To leap means to jump. It means to make a big jump. So before you jump, you should look. Look where you're jumping. That's the title. Of course, we're live today. We're live on Facebook. I mean, no, 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 we're not. We're on YouTube. <laughs> we're live on YouTube today, and we have Alexi and Bufendra and Anand and lots of our regular pe- people, Lisa, Isol, Ahmed, Ibrahim Ali, of course, Vladislav, of course, and many others. Hey, Emmanuel, good to see you, Abramane, etc. Welcome, guys. All right, let's just jump in, shall we? Let's read the story. I'll read the story first. This one's a little longer, actually. It's a full page. Most of these are very short. Some of these are just like a little paragraph. And this one's a little bit longer. It's one page, but not too long. So the name of it is Look Before You Leap. And as usual, we have animal characters, the fox. We see in his stories, the foxes are not very nice. They're clever, but they're not very nice. They're always cheating people, right? In these stories, the foxes are constantly cheating people. So it's kind of a warning, of course, about people, human beings. There are humans in the world, and they also constantly, constantly cheating other people. So it's a little bit of a warning to us. We have to be careful when we're dealing with other people, especially people we don't know. But let's get to the story. A fox tumbled into a water tank. He could not get out. Along came a thirsty goat, seeing the fox ask him if the water was good. The fox jumped at the chance. He sang the praises of the water. With eloquence, he urged the goat to come down. The goat was so thirsty, he went down into the water tank without stopping to think, and he drank his fill. Then they began to consider... How to get out again. How to get up again. I have an idea, said the fox. If you're willing to do something to help us both, be kind, put your feet against the wall, and hold your horns straight up. Then I can jump up and I can pull you up too. The goat was happy to comply. The fox clambered nimbly over his uh, shoulders. He reached the edge of the tank and he began to leave. The goat complained that he had broken their agreement. But he only said, the fox said, you have more hairs in your beard than your brains. Then you have brains in your head. You're not smart. Otherwise, you wouldn't have gone down without thinking how you're going to get up. So you see, again, the foxes are really kind of nasty, bad people. And they're nasty, bad. There are people like this in the world that are constantly lying and cheating. They blame everybody else. And that's what the foxes are usually like in these stories so far. 
And then we have the message at the end of the story from Aesop. He says, a sensible man never embarks on an enterprise until he can see his way clear to the end. All right, there you go. There you go. All right, let's go back to the beginning. And let's find out the meaning of this and learn some of this vocab. The title, look before you leap, look before you jump. Remember, a leap is a jump. Very similar meaning, leap and jump. So look before you jump. We have a fox. He tumbled into a water tank. Tumbled means fell, kind of to fall and to roll at the same time, right? So you fall down and you kind of roll around. That's called tumbling. To tumble is the verb, to tumble. So he fell into a water tank. The fox did. So he's at the bottom. There's water. And he can't get out. It's too deep. It's too deep. He cannot get out by himself. So then he's down there and a thirsty goat, a goat, right, with the horns, a thirsty goat comes along. And the fox says, ah, the fox is clever. He's going to cheat him. He says, ah, good. I'll get the goat to help me. So the, the goat asks him, is the water good? And the fox says, yes, yes, the water is good. He sings the praises of the water. This is kind of an idiom to sing praises, singing like, ah, but to sing praises means to compliment, to say very good things about something. He sings the praises of the water means he says, oh, the water's great. It's so wonderful. Come down here, Mr. Goat. He urged the goat to come down. To urge is kind of like to persuade, to push, right? Try to persuade. Come on, come on, come on. That's to urge. The goat was so thirsty, he went down into the tank without stopping to think. So the goat didn't think. He didn't think, how can I get back out? He just was so thirsty, he wanted to drink the water. And he listened to the fox. So he drank his fill. To drink his fill means he drank as much as he wanted to. Again, a little bit of an idiom. To drink your fill means drink until you're full. To eat your fill means to eat until you are full. Okay, then after he drinks, he realizes, oh no, now I'm stuck down here with the fox. So they both began to consider, to think about how to get up again. And this is where the fox really cheats him. He says, I have a good idea. If you can help us both, right? So this is, again, we're kind of learning, right? This is what these bad people do. These liars. They, they use your goodness against you. So the goat's good. The goat wants to help both. So this is what they do. You know, this is a very good lesson in life. What do bad people do? They don't just... I mean, there are some evil people who just attack you, right? And it's they're violent and they attack you. Yes, that happens. But a lot of these kind of cheaters, what they do is they use your goodness. They use your kindness against you. So you must be very careful about being kind to other people, especially strangers. If you're kind to someone you know, then it's more safe. But with strangers, with people you don't know, you must be very careful about being kind to them because many of them will... They see your kindness, they think it's weakness, and they'll use your kindness against you to cheat you. And that's what the fox does. So he says, okay. He tells him, he says, put your feet against the wall, right, to kind of get high, higher up, to get higher. And then the fox will climb on top of him and then jump up and escape. That's his idea. And he tells the goat, he lies to the goat. He said, after I get out, then I'll put my hand down and I'll help you get up also. And the goat, you know, the goat's very nice. The goat's, well, that's what the goat would do. So the goat thinks, oh, well, he must be also kind. So he does it. He says the goat was happy to comply. To comply means to, uh, like, be obedient, to follow an idea, to follow orders, to follow instructions. It means it's to comply, to comply. The fox clambered. To clamber is kind of like to climb quickly. To clamber. He clambered. Nimbly means skillfully, you know, with gracefully. Over the shoulders and horns. And he got out. He gets out of the tank. But then when he gets out, the fox does not turn around and help him. He just starts to leave. And the goat complains. You broke our agreement. 
Does the fox help him? No, the fox just laughs. Ha ha, I cheated you. Ha ha, you're stupid. He says, you have more brains, I mean, more hairs in your head than brains in your head. It means you don't have brains. You're stupid. And of course, he's not stupid. The goat's not stupid. The goat's just too kind. He's too trusting. See, this is how these people, and there are whole groups of people like this, they use our trust against us. They use our goodness against us. And that's what the foxes do in these stories many times. They, the other animals are maybe kind and good, and the fox cheats them using their kindness, using their trust. So, you know, a big message in Aesop is don't trust these strangers. People you don't know, you must be more careful about them. Don't, don't automatically trust people you don't know, even if they are talking very nicely and they seem kind. You must be a little suspicious. And that's good advice. And then finally, so he she just says he laughs and he doesn't help him. He says, uh, if you were smarter, you would have, before you went down, you would have thought ahead. You should have thought ahead. You made a plan how to get back out again. All right. And then the message from Aesop, the message of the story from, he says, a sensible man. A sensible man means uh, an intelligent man, a rational man, never embarks on an enterprise. To embark means to leave or to begin, like to begin a trip, to begin a new project, to embark on. It's a phrasal verb, embark on. An enterprise just means any project. It might be a trip, it might be a business, any action really, an enterprise, a project or action. Until he can see his way clear to the end, meaning you can see the end, you, you know how to finish it. So... Aesop saying that the meaning of the story is don't start something that maybe is risky or dangerous until you think ahead. So that's the message of this story, the main message of the story. Think ahead before you start something. Think ahead. Think about how will this end? What are the dangers? Right? Like the goat. He should have thought ahead. He, he should not have automatically trusted the fox. He should have thought, how will I get out? right? Before he jumped in, right? So look before you leap, right? Look ahead into the future before you do something dangerous or risky. Think ahead is really the message of this. Think ahead. All right, that's it. That is all. So again, just to review the quick, quick review of some of the vocab. To tumble, the fox tumbled into the tank. To tumble is to fall and roll. He kind of fell and he rolled into this deep water tank. To sing the praises of someone or something. If you sing their praises, it means you compliment them. You say lots of good things about them. To urge. To urge is to kind of try to push someone verbally, you know, uh, to try to persuade someone. You urge them. Come on, do this. Do it. Do it. To drink your fill means drink as much as you can. To clamber, to clamber is to kind of climb very quickly, to clamber up, to clamber over something. Sensible means intelligent and, uh, you know, wise, sensible, rational. To embark on means to begin something. Often we'll use this to embark on a trip, to embark on a journey means to begin a trip, to begin a journey. And an enterprise, an enterprise is some kind of project or big action. All right, time for questions and comments. If you have questions about the vocab, let me know. If you have comments or questions about the story, also let me know. We're live on YouTube. Let's see. Christy says, you're such a good storyteller, the twins are lucky. Reading stories for children gives so many benefits. Um, I speak from my, from my own experience. Indeed, indeed. This is the beginnings of you know teaching your children learning at the young age is you begin by reading to them. This will teach them to appreciate books and stories. And uh, it will later, it will teach them to become good readers themselves they'll they'll learn to enjoy books and as they get older as they learn to read then they will want to read you won't have to push them you know 
Uh, so you have to, sh this is a great way. You're giving an example. So you read stories, you know, like this to your children, and then you talk about the stories. You can act the stories. You can use fun voices. Uh, you can do all of these things. And they really will learn to love books. And that's a good thing to teach your children. And you can do this when they're quite young, even as babies. Alex now says, thank you, AJ. I love you. You helped me so much. From Russia with Love, which is a nice James Bond movie too, by the way. <laughs> From Russia with Love. I can't remember the song. Something like that. <laughs> Umer says, sometimes people we know also cheat us. Yes, but if you're if you're not stupid, if you're smart, uh, if you know somebody is a cheat, if you know you can't trust someone, then don't let them cheat you many times, right? Yeah, I had a friend like this. You know, it's still someone I'm, you know, I'll see sometimes. But, uh, you know, just... Uh, you know, he cheated, he kind of cheated, would cheat everybody, you know, with things like money, like small things. And eventually everybody learned, can't really trust this guy. He's always going to try to cheat money. If you go to dinner, he won't, he's going to pay less than he should. You know, he's going to try to borrow money and not pay back. All this kind of stuff. So then, you know, one by one, his friends stopped trusting him. And one by one, you know, now none of his friends, they won't give him any money. Uh, they don't like to go to dinner with him. So it's his loss. You know, when you know people, you can see the pattern. So, yes, they might cheat you sometimes, but don't be stupid. If after they cheat you once or twice, then don't let them do it again. But with someone you don't know, it's more of a risk. Yeah, Ladislav with another nice fox and story in Russia, a Russia story, Russian story. Uh, there, so there's a crow and a fox. The crow is up on the tree, the black birds, right? And uh, the crow is eating cheese. He's got some nice cheese. He's eating it up on the tree. The fox came up. He complimented the crow, right? He said he sang his praises. He said nice things to the crow. The crow yelled, yay, thank you, cheerfully. And when he yelled, the cheese fell on the ground. And then the fox ate it. So, the, so again, we have these fox. In these stories, the foxes are usually very tricky. Uh, you can't trust them. They're always cheating other people or other animals. <laughs> Vladislav with a good follow-up question. The foxes are evil or they're kind of cheaters in most tales and fables, but why? I think it's because, you know, foxes have a reputation for being very clever. They're very sneaky and clever. Right. Because, um, you know, foxes are kind of famous that they're hard to catch. So like if hunters are chasing them, dogs are chasing a fox, that the foxes can be very clever, that they they hide and they they circle around and they do all these little tricks so that the dogs cannot catch them uh, or the hunters cannot catch them. So I think, uh, you know, over time many, 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 many years, maybe hundreds of years, they start to get a reputation of being kind of clever, kind of smart and tricky, right? And then, so then they make, that's when these writers like Aesop make stories then, then they kind of give the same personality to the fox. It, you, you see it also sometimes with rabbits, you know, like Bugs Bunny. Bugs Bunny has a kind of a similar personality in the old Bugs Bunny cartoons, right? He's always kind of tricking and cheating. He's very clever. And he's always tricking and cheating the humans and the other animals, right? And he's kind of, you know, and he always enjoys that doing that. So sometimes you'll see this with rabbits in stories, but especially foxes, a lot with foxes. Yeah, like, you know, there's a balance in this, like, um, Andrea Romero says, Nowadays, it's hard to trust others, but we have to carefully if we want to succeed in life. It's also true we can't do everything on our own by ourselves. That's exactly right. We can't. So, you know, again, it's like a, it's kind of a, a you know, again, we say in English, you trust is earned. Trust must be earned. You don't automatically give a lot of trust to somebody that you don't know. 
you know, don't you you don't not, don't be afraid and paranoid all the time, but you know, you're always a little careful in the beginning. So they earn you let other people earn their tr your trust. So you trust them a little bit and see what happens. Uh, do they act in a good way? Do their actions follow their words? If yes, then you can now give them a little more trust. And then you continue to do things with them. And again, you know, maybe you have some tough situation. Well, do they do they behave? Do they act in a good way? When they have a chance to cheat you, do they cheat you or do they are they still honest? And if they're honest and good, now you know you can trust them more. They earned more trust. So it's a step-by-step -step process with new people. Now, hopefully in your own family, you've you know them for years and years, so you already know who you can trust and who you cannot. Messi, why don't you write down the vocabs? Yes, you can write down the vocabs. Write it in the comments, guys. Think, think of it as practice. <laughs> Tayaki says, how is the goat going to get out? I feel sorry for him. We don't know. We never find out in this story. We have no idea. Right? It's sad, right? This is the message he's sending us. It's a sad, sad situation. He's warning us. And Aesop uh, is warning us again and again and again in many of these stories. You've got to be careful because, yeah, it's bad to be a victim. That he's telling us, on one hand, we want to be kind and good and trusting, but on the other hand, it's dangerous to do it too much because then you get cheated and, yeah, maybe the goat dies. We don't know. Maybe the goat, maybe someone nice, another animal comes and helps him. We never find out, but it's kind of scary for the goat. So that's his message, you know. And, of course, during Aesop's time, he lived in, you know, thousands of years ago, the world was probably more dangerous in general, more dangerous and uh, people had to be even more careful at that time. So it's kind of, you know, his stories are meant to teach you good lessons. And a lot of the stories are warnings to be careful. So, yeah, we don't want to be the goat. <laughs> we want to be kind, but we don't want to be cheated. Lexi says, sometimes in life we have to take immediate decisions without doubting. If we'll stop and start to think fear can absorb us. Lots of things are trivia because of fear we do nothing. Absolutely, that's right. You're also right. Again, this is kind of the balancing side of look before you leap. There's look before you leap, but then sometimes you have to make strong, strong, strong actions. And what's the, uh, what's the, what decides, you know, it's the risk. A lot of it is the risk. How big is the risk? And also, you know, when you only when you're not ha when you don't need to trust someone you don't know, you can make faster and better decisions, right? Uh, also, in life, hopefully, as you gain more experience, you'll get better at seeing the liars. You know, there are a few people who are really, really good liars, but there, most people are not really, really good liars. And so you can start to see patterns that certain groups of people, certain kinds of people, certain kinds of behavior, you kind of know, ah, don't trust them. So again, like I've used travel as an example many times, my first time traveling in India, I got cheated constantly, constantly was cheated because I was like the goat. I was like the goat, just automatically trusting everybody. And all these liars and cheaters were constantly focusing on me and others. And so I was constantly being cheated all the time, all the time. Luckily, nothing dangerous. Just lost some money, mostly, and sometimes some time. But here's the good thing, because after the, by the end of that trip, after two months of that, I became much more clever. I started to understand that certain kinds of people, I should not trust them automatically. For example, anyone who would just, in on the street, just come and start talking to me and acting really friendly... Well, in the beginning, I, oh, nice, they're just nice. But by the end of the trip, I realized that's not normal behavior for most people. And in fact, I should be very careful if someone does that. And you should too. And now, of course, I've traveled many, many, many years. So automatically for me, that is suspicious behavior. Now, occasionally, they're just nice and they just want to talk and that's fine. But, you know, I, I will be careful for a while Little by little, it's trying to see what do they want? What do they really want? 
Now, in other areas of life where it's just my own decisions, like, you know, business decisions, for example, I will make very fast decisions, very fast. So it kind of depends. And the more experience you get in some part of life, you, you will make faster and faster decisions. So you're right. We always have to balance these things. Yeah, like uh, Andrejenia, uh, Andreinha, Andreinha, I hope so I'm pronouncing your name right. Uh, Portuguese, I think, right? I'm guessing Brazilian. Even when you meet people on in a language exchange program, you can find suspicious potential partners. They end up being cheaters. Yes, you can. That's right. Those uh, language exchanges like italki. A lot of the people are just friendly, nice people, good people. They just want to practice language. But you get some people who are not. You get some, uh, guy, you'll get guys on there who are looking for women, right? So they're always contacting girls and trying to get something from them, right? They're looking for girls, for sex, for romance. Which, and that's not why people are there. So you got to be careful with that. And then others might try to cheat you and they might try to, oh, yeah, be nice. And then they start asking you for some money. Oh, they say, oh, I've got some problem. My my grandmother's sick. Oh, can you help me? Can you send me some money? You know, that kind of stuff. They're foxes. So, yes, that's right. Yeah, so Riem Ming says, Hi, I'm from Cambodia, nice country. I've been listening to you as part of my everyday activities. I listen to you while I'm cooking and washing my clothes. Also, I shadow your accent. My wife thinks I'm crazy. Well, <laughs> it's a good crazy. There's bad crazy and there's good crazy. Bad crazy are people who uh, are homeless and they, you know, they cannot function in life. Good crazy are people who are super enthusiastic super energetic about good positive things so you're good crazy and that's wonderful that's exactly a great thing to do you can listen while you're doing other things you know you guys know i i love listening uh while i walk and i recommend that you can listen while you're cooking while you're washing clothes while you're in a car while you're in a bus or a train right all these kind of things while you're in line shopping all these kinds of things you can get extra listening in. it's a good good idea Yeah, like Omar Khalid says, we must be careful with foxes in our lives. That's exactly the message. That's right. Baha Janabi. Will these stories help me understand native speakers? These Are these stories informal, not slang? Well, no, these, they're used, these are idioms, which are uh, naturally very casual. Uh, most of these, you know, you're not going to find these idioms in academic textbooks usually. Um, some of the vocal, it's actually an interesting mix, these stories. Now, this is a translation I have, right? I mean, the original is in Greek. But uh, my translation, it's a, quite an interesting uh, combination. It's hard for me to say. Some of the vocab is a little formal, a little more advanced, you know, tumbled and uh, enterprise and things like that. Um, on the other hand, the idioms are very casual, very informal. Um, so I think it's actually a nice mix. You're getting, uh, you know, these good vocab words, which are a little more advanced, uh, but you're also getting the very conversational, uh, casual idioms. So I, I kind of I quite like it because you're getting actually both levels in these stories. But yes, that's why we're doing these stories. They it definitely will help you. Edimar Sahib asks, "Have you ever been to the Philippines?" Only the airport, only Manila Airport. I've never uh, traveled in the Philippines. I would like to. It's not so far from Japan. Uh, there, I know there are many wonderful places, like for just for vacations. Like uh, my wife and I are interested in Cebu. So there's some good diving in Cebu. Wonderful beaches. Uh, I know there are just lots and lots and lots of great places in the Philippines. The other nice thing I would say about the Philippines is um, while traveling the world. I have met many Filipinos, in, for example, in Thailand, in uh, Cambodia, in Hawaii, in America. And uh, overall, I just find the, that in general, Filipinos are very, very friendly, very kind of, uh, kind of very open. 
right? Like they'll just start talking to you. <laughs> like I remember I was in Hawaii. We were, uh, oh no, Guam. We were in Guam. And uh, we were just at a, at a bus stop. And uh, there was a woman and a man. I think it was her father. Uh, and uh, we're sitting there and she just, oh, hi, how are you? And she just started talking and talking and so friendly and smiling. And she was Filipino. Um, and so I, I find that seems like it's very common with Filipinos. Very, that very friendliness and openness. Shadia says, to be clever doesn't mean you're a cheater. No, it's, that's right. But often cheaters are clever, <laughs> right? <laughs> clever is kind of a, a type of intelligence, like uh, the ability to think quickly, right? And find kind of creative. It's kind of creative intelligence is what I think of clever. So that could be used in a nice way too, uh, but it can be used to cheat people. So often people who cheat are also clever. All right, so that's a good point. Clever is a neutral word. It's not, I wouldn't say positive or negative. It can be either. Emmanuel with a very uh, good question. In your opinion, do we need to cast aside to get rid of some of our peers? Peers are your, like your equals, co-workers, maybe some friends, you know, people who are kind of your same uh, social level. Because, unfortunately, I recently started off working, I guess, we're oh, okay, and I noticed some of them are hypocrites. They talk behind my back always. Yeah, get rid of those people. You can't trust them. So now you know, right? You have evidence that you cannot trust them. They say bad things about you. You know they're saying bad things about you. So don't trust them. And certainly don't be their friends. You know, in life, uh, you know, we use this word friends sometimes. Uh when we're, but we're not we're too generally, I think. In English, I know Spanish people use it even more generally. They'll call everybody, my friend, my friend, mi amigo, mi amigo. They just met you, right? Amigo, amigo. And they, they just met you two minutes ago. <laughs> um, but uh, like a real friend is someone that you really can trust. You can rely on them. You have some, um, it requires time. You know, it requires uh earning trust both sides of course both sides you know they learn to trust you because in difficult times you're there you're with them you're loyal to them you're helping them and you learn to trust them for the same reasons and for me that's what a real friend is like i use the word friend now much more carefully when i was young like anybody i did something with it was my friend my friends my friends my friends you know if i just hanging out having a good time i would say oh this is my friend um, but honestly, when I, I, later I realized some of them were not really friends because, uh, I could not actually trust them. They were not reliable. And, uh, and so this is something sometimes as you get older, you start to realize, you start to identify who are my real friends and who are the people I just hang out with sometimes, you know, it's fine. It's okay. Everyone does not need to be your friend. It's fine to hang out with people and just enjoy having fun with them. That's fine. But just the level of trust, right, is much less. You know that probably you can't trust them in, with something important. Like Nasser says, trust is free but hard to get. Yes, must be earned. <laughs> hey, I'm Mixat. Mixat provider says, foxes are like cats. They're smart. Maybe because of this, they constantly seem like bad boys. Yeah, right, right. Sometimes, uh, you know, there's a nice word in Japanese, ijiwaru, ijiwaru. Uh, I think in English, the closest would be mischievous. Um, now, in this story, the fox is not only mischievous. The fox is actually quite a cheater. He's, he's, he's very bad. He's, he's kind of evil a bit. In this story, more than a bit, he leaves the goat possibly to die. So he's the fox in this story is quite evil. But there's kind of a lesser level where you're just a little bad, a little naughty, right? Like you'll see it with children a lot. I would say in this in the cartoons, Bugs Bunny, he's like that. He's not evil. Bugs Bunny doesn't really he doesn't try to kill anybody in those cartoons, right? But he's just a little naughty. He's kind of clever and naughty, right? And in uh, English. 
A good word for that is mischievous, mischievous, mischievous or mischievous. You'll hear it pronounced both ways. Um, so that kind of mischievousness uh, sometimes is cute. Uh, sometimes it's kind of cute when it's uh, like with children, for example. It's just that little bit of naughtiness, but not not trying to hurt anybody. Kind of just trying to be a little tricky. Um, you know, I have a nephew like that. <laughs> He's definitely like that a lot. And it's, you know, it's funny. He's trying to be funny. He's trying to joke and be funny. He's not trying to hurt anybody. Yeah, Fernanda, good to see you again. She says, I like this show with the, the fables. It's like a little book club. It is, right? It's like a little book club. And the book club, we're doing these big books and quite serious books. Um, but I like this because it's just these little tiny stories. Each one's different. And like I'll show you on my page if you're watching on video. I mean, some of them are so short. Look at that one. We'll get to this one later. It's number 54 in my book. Uh, but that's just one little paragraph. So some of them are very short. The longest ones are just one page. The one we just did is one of the longest ones in my book. Um, so there are these very short little uh, stories with the animal characters. They've, but what's great is each one has a lot of vocab in it. Actually, we're probably getting, you know, five, four, five, six new vocab words in every story. We're getting idioms, one, two, three idioms or more in every story. There's a... Uh, it's like there's this great little meaning and message, and it's all very, very short. So you're right. It's like a mini book club. Yeah, right. There's a saying. I think it, is this from the Bible, I think, Christy? Maybe I'm wrong. Be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. This is good advice for good people. To be wise as a serpent. A serpent is a snake. So wise as a serpent is the idea to be suspicious, to be careful, to be clever. Look before you leap. Be, you know, don't trust automatically. But on the other side, to balance that, be harmless as doves. A dove is like a white bird that's very peaceful. So you don't try to hurt anybody, but don't trust too much. Be careful. So be careful, be smart, but also be kind. It's a nice, it's good advice. Oh, Andrea, no problem. Happy. Oh, you're from a Spanish-speaking country. My real name is Andrea. I'm writing you from Colombia. Oh, okay. I thought the spelling of your first name looked... Portuguese. Well, Spanish. Colombia. Great. Spanish. Yeah, like Hassam says, uh, Hassam Ware says, real friends are like diamonds and precious stones. They are indeed. You will learn this as you go forward in life, that those really good friends that you can trust, that when you are really having a hard time in your life you really need them and they will and they're still there to help you and you also help them of course it's both ways but you'll find that they're rare they're, you know most people only have if they're lucky a couple people like that ah nice asma with a success story asma abbas I want to thank you. I took the IELTS test recently. I got six out of nine in speaking, even though that was my first time speaking with a native speaker. Whoa, you rock. Very nice. All because of your method. Thanks. Excellent. Congratulations to you. First time speaking to a native speaker. Amazing. Really great. Really great. And Andrea says, I'd love you for you to come to Colombia. I want to come. I, I believe me, I, I want to do it. Uh, uh, I would like to go to Colombia. Um, I mean, I, honestly, I'd have to say I want to go to South America in general because I've never been there. And uh, I would like to perhaps even starting up, you know, technically a Central America, but like Costa Rica and Panama. And then I would love to go over to Colombia and uh, 
if Venezuela ever calms down and stabilizes, that'd be nice too. But if not, uh, Brazil, Brazil, Argentina, Chile, um, Uruguay, Paraguay. I mean, really, honestly, you know, I have to be honest, like I, uh, what's it called? Uh, motorcycle Diaries. Maybe you've, if you guys ever seen the movie, it's based on Che Guevara's uh, diaries. I'm not a big fan of Che Guevara's, but the movie's very nice because the movie's not really about communism or anything like that. The movie's just about uh, his big motorcycle trip that he took when he was young, he, uh, he and his friend. And they started in, uh, I think it was Buenos Aires down in Argentina, and they rode a motorcycle um, all the way up to, where did they go? Is it Colombia? It might have been Colombia. Uh, so they went basically all the way up from kind of the bottom of South America, riding on a motorcycle on all these little roads, you know, up through. I'm, I can't remember exactly. I think they did go to Chile and Ecuador and some other places. And I think they finished in up at, in the north part of South America at the top. Uh, I, I think it was Colombia. And uh, it's just, it's a great story. I always get inspired by those kinds of stories. So I kind of have this little dream in my mind of doing that, you know, now with my family, of doing like this huge tour. So it would take many months, obviously, uh, some kind of big, grand tour of South America, visiting all these countries. It would be great. It'd be a good reason for me to start and try to improve my Spanish again. There's Omar from Venezuela. Great. Yeah, like McSat says, he's con he or she is confirming what I said about another topic I've been talking about recently. I work uh, at an internet provider. I constantly listen to you talking about the problems of technology nowadays. I agree with you. It's dangerous that people are losing their sense of truth. Absolutely. And it's, again, this concentration of power because so much power now online, it's controlled by a few bad companies, Google, Facebook, Twitter, Apple, Amazon. Those five are probably the giants, right? Too much power. Too much power, and they're not good. All right. Yeah, like Nasser says. Cheaters ha uh, know how to make a good excuse for cheating. That's right. The good cheaters, you know, like I said, there are just evil people who are violent and dangerous. We know, we all know this, right? But I think more common, I think there are more people who are more like the foxes. And uh, they're the ones, you know, there's again, wolves in sheep's clothing. There's another idiom, a wolf in sheep's clothing. It comes from the story Little Red Riding Hood, you know, right? Little Red Riding Hood, she goes and she sees... Yeah, she thinks it's her grandmother. Uh, and actually, no, I guess it doesn't come from that. I'm not sure what story it comes from. But anyway, the idea is that the wolf will put on a costume to pretend to be a sheep. The wolf pretends to be a harmless animal and, and then attacks you, right? Or then cheats you. And it's kind of the same idea here that uh, people who are good, they always are They're quite good to appear friendly. They're always... They're smiling. Uh, a lot of cheaters in, on, in like cities, different cities around the world, they'll actually dress quite nice. Some of them will even like wear a suit. So they'll have like a suit and a tie. So you think, oh, well, I must trust them. They look nice. They look like a business person. And then they cheat you, right? So they're quite clever. And, uh, and some of them are very good at pretending to be harmless. So you have to be careful. Roman Goltra asks, thanks, he says, thanks for your videos. How many times should I listen to one and the same mini story? One or two weeks, thanks. Um, one or two weeks, it's your decision. Uh, I'd say more is better. I recently talked about this. Again, it's one of these things where we want to have a mix, a balance of, on one hand, very deep learning, 
I think it's important. So you want to get that big repetition. The mini stories are good for that because you're getting the most uh, common vocab, the most common grammar, uh, and you're, you're learning it very, very deeply with that repetition. And then you also, to keep your brain interested, you also want to do wide learning where you're just like listening to my podcast, listening to other podcasts, watching movies, reading books. That's why we're doing the book club. It's why we're doing the movie club. It's why I'm doing these fables. I'm giving you the wide learning with all of this. And so that combination of both is super powerful. Yeah, Elena says, hey, Elena, I listened to your podcast about the Camino de Santiago, your dream to do it again. It sounds quite challenging to travel such a trip with two children. It does indeed. <laughs> I'd love to join you with my family with great pleasure. It, uh, yeah, come on. Um, it is challenging. Uh, uh, yes, as I just think about it, I'm not even really doing a lot of specific planning yet because it's probably a couple of years away. But, uh, you know, I know the Camino since I did it myself with my friend Joe. Um, you know, so I know exactly what to expect from the Camino. And so when I imagine doing it with two small children, it, it it's, it's a challenge, but it can be done. I know other people have done it. I've already done, I've read some blogs of families that have walked the Camino. So I have a general idea how they do it. They use strollers where they push the babies. And there's special ones you can buy that are more that are good for like trails, you know, you can take them on little dirt paths and things like that. Um, but I know there are also some sections of the Camino in the mountains where that might not work. So there's still some things I have to figure out. Um, and of course I have to figure out, we're gonna have to make do shorter days because the babies, you know, they, they're gonna get tired. They don't wanna, it's not like adults. An adult can walk 12 hours, you know, but uh, a child, to be carried or even pushed for 12 hours, they're gonna get really bored in there. So you're gonna to have to break it up, have to do much shorter days. So it's gonna take longer to do it, um, but it can be done and it will be done. I think overall, it'll be a great experience for our family. Chimvik says, AJ, why do you hate the US? I don't hate the US. I was born in Russia, I still live here. As our government hates their people, we are not free. Every government hates their people. You're not alone. You think the American government loves the American people? They hate the American people. They are the enemies of the American people. The American media, the American government. And yeah, so it's the same in Russia. It's the same everywhere that I know. Okay, It's the same uh, evil people at the top always. And, and let's be honest, the governments are not at the top. You know, it's the banks and the banking families are really at the top. They by the politicians, they buy the governments and control them, and they are evil. And that's why with this global system, we see that every country in the world has this problem. You know, people like sometimes criticize, why do Americans, why do you like war? Why are you attacking? Well, we are not attacking. American people don't like that. American people don't want that. The American government does it, and they don't care what we think. They ignore us. They do anything they want. American people, it's very clear, you know, there's all kinds of polls and opinion polls and you can just talk to Americans. They don't want any of that. They don't want to invade any countries. In fact, you talk to most Americans, they don't even want our army in other countries. They want to bring them all home. America, this is what, you know, there's the phrase, America first. It means we're, we're sick. We don't want to be the police of the world. We don't, but they don't listen to us because we don't have power. Democracy is a lie. It's a big lie. Um, so it's just like Brit in Britain. It's a, it was a lie. They voted for Brexit, and now they're not going to do it. They're totally ignoring the vote. Democracy is a lie. They just use it as an excuse. They do anything they want. So, you know, yeah, it's, I'm sure it's the same in Russia. I don't know specifically about Russia, but I'm not surprised if it's the same in Russia and the same in every other country in the world. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, I don't hate America, but I hate the American government. And I hate the people above the American government, the globalists. I hate them, but I love America. I love my country. I'm uh, Many wonderful things I love, especially about traditional America, about the old 
traditional American values and culture and history. I love, love, love very much, very much. What I hate is that those things are being attacked and destroyed. Yeah, Ian with a good point. Uh, sometimes when we find naughty children that are clever, we laugh and we love them more because they're funny. Uh, do you think we might encourage them to be cheaters in the future? We have to be careful. Yes, we must be careful about this. Right. Um, on one hand, they are very cute <laughs> and funny when they do this, but we don't want to encourage it too much because, uh, well, as you said, it can become something that's quite bad, right? A little bit that's kind of funny is cute, but if if we encourage it too much by laughing and enjoying it, Right, they might do even more, and then do even more, and then do even more. And then when they get older, you know, they might become more like the fox. And we don't want that, of course. So, yes, yeah, sometimes you have to be careful. Sometimes you have to pretend. You know, as parents, all, you all know this. Sometimes you have to pretend. You have to fake your emotions. Like, you're not really upset. You're not really angry. But you kind of have to pretend because they're doing something that really is not good. It's cute. You actually, you want to laugh, but you, you can't laugh. You have to kind of pretend like, no, that's not good. Don't do that. And okay. And then when they walk away and leave, then you laugh, <laughs> right? And then you laugh and you talk to your wife or your husband and you laugh about it because it's actually funny, right? So this is all parents have to do this. All right, I'm going to jump down to the bottom here. Oh, Jeff Gomez from Brazil says, first time I've been here. Welcome, Jeff. Oh, Elaine is asking more about the Camino. I'm always happy to talk about the Camino. Did you have a guide on the Camino trip? I had a guide book, a guide book in English. Um, I don't remember the title right now, but there are many in different languages. Uh, guidebooks for the Camino. A lot of people walk the Camino. So the, the guidebook had, um, had maps of the whole way. And, uh, and then they had like, you know, in each, each town, they would have a list of the places to stay, like hotels, guest houses, hostels, churches, and they would have phone numbers uh, and also on the map. So it was quite easy, actually. Very good. These guidebooks are quite good. Um, it was very easy to find places to stay and places to eat. No problem. Did you have a hotel room? Did you book a hotel room every night? Um, so what we did in the beginning, we did not. We would just uh, walk. We would arrive in the town at, in the evening. And then we would just look around and ask, do you have rooms? Do you have rooms? Do you have rooms? And that was that was okay. Probably about the middle of the trip, uh, it started to get a little busier. And um, I, I, Joe and I were staying in different rooms at that time. Uh, he was probably still a little more loose like that. And, but I started to call ahead in the morning usually. So just one day ahead, I would call and make a reservation in the next town, in the, the you know, where, the final town. Um, just because I got tired of, it just took time, you know. Like already, I, I, you, you're walking all day, you arrive in town, and then, you know, they spend another 30 minutes trying to find a place to stay. Sometimes you go one place, they're full, then you have to go another. And I just tired. I was like, oh, I'm tired of doing this. I'll just call ahead in the morning. Then I already have a reservation, so I can just go straight to my <laughs> guest house and take a shower and get some food. So I started calling ahead one day before. Well, really the same day. I would call in the morning. Usually. Bolsonaro 2019. Hey, hey, I like Bolsonaro. He's funny. He's also, he's funny. He's, he's kind of a comedian. Trump's funny too. Dracula Ye says, AJ, I'm very thankful to you because about 90% of my English is learned from you. Well, that's nice. Well, thank you. Congratulations. Uh, 
Uh, Roman Preet says, I want to be fluent in English very soon for a school professional. To be a school professional, I guess. Please help. Well, you know, uh, it's really just you got to do a lot of hours every day. Lots of listening, lots of reading, and then eventually chatting with people. Um, so, you know, more hours per day. If you want to go faster, you have to do more hours per day. It's actually pretty simple. Uh, not easy, but it's simple. Uh, oh, Ayo says, what do you think about Arabian Nights? See, those are also great stories, great traditional stories. There are many English translations of those stories. There are lots of these kinds of stories, these traditional stories, you know. Uh, some of them are fables that use animal characters, like uh, Vladislav said, you know, in Russian, they have many of these stories. Most countries and cultures have something like this, and others are more like uh, fantasy and have human characters. And, you know, there's the fairy tales, the grim fairy tales are quite famous. Um, so, yeah, lots of good ones out there. Lots of good ones. And who knows, we'll do, you know, it, it's going to be a long time to finish this book because today in my book, I'm just going in order. I'm just going one by one. So today we are story number seven. And this book of mine has... Uh, over 200. So we got a long time to finish this book, but when we finally finish it, um, maybe I'll find some other traditional stories that are, but short, short's the key thing. Very short. Sarah S. says, is it okay I feel bored while learning languages? Uh, no, not really. <laughs> uh, if you're bored, then um, you're going to learn more slowly. You're, gonna, you're not going to be motivated. Uh, so you're probably going to not work so hard. You're not going to do many hours. So yeah, is that a problem? It is a problem. Yeah, it is. So you've got to find a way to make it interesting. You have to do it. How do you do that? Well, you, you do, uh, I was just listening to uh, 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 Steve Kaufman's podcast. He was talking exactly about this exact topic. His number one most important thing about language learning. So Steve Kaufman now speaks 20 languages. I'd say he's an expert. And uh, it's interesting. So he kind of was talking about what are his secrets, you know, in his opinion, what's the most important thing, the most important number one for learning languages, right? Like how has he learned 20 languages? What's the most important thing? And what's interesting, he did not talk about methods. He did not talk about lessons. It was attitude. Number one thing is to love it, to enjoy it. That was his number one point. How did he learn 20 languages? You have to love what you're doing. Not just love the idea, but actually love the activities you're doing. So he said that, you know, one of his key points his of advice is, if you really hate doing something, like if you hate flashcards, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't force yourself to do it because then you're just making the language learning painful and boring. So some people like flashcards. Okay, if you like it, do it. Okay, great. But he said you've got to make it enjoyable, and I think that's excellent advice, and I have noticed the same thing with uh, all the thousands of students who have succeeded with Effortless English, and especially the ones... Uh, who have had a very high level of success, who've, who've become, you know, high level of fluency, nice pronunciation, you know, very, very good speakers. They all have that same thing. They really enjoy it. It's, it's not so much the, the exact method. It's their attitude. They love it. They really, really, really enjoy it. They enjoy the mini stories. They enjoy the topics of the VIP lessons or Power English. They enjoy listening to podcasts and shows. They enjoy eventually watching movies. They find books that they enjoy. You've got to figure out the activities of language learning and the content, right? The specific books or audios or videos or lessons that you like, right? So there's, and, and some of it will be different for different people. So I'll give you an example, like at a beginning level of language learning. Um, 
that's I I I don't like it. <laughs> I don't enjoy the beginning. I find it really boring. Um, so there, you know, many lots of people give different advice. Like certain programs, certain lessons are good for beginners. Some people recommend Asimil. It's a French company. Lots of these guys, lots of these people like Steve Kaufman that speak many languages. They love Asimil. I hate it. I tried it. I hate it. I find it so 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 boring. I just so I finally realized I was trying to force myself to use Asimil. And I finally said, this is crazy. I hate this. It's boring. There are many other things I can do. I'm not, I just stop using it. On the other hand, on the other hand, one that I really like for beginners is Pimsleur. I really like Pimsleur. And I don't know why I do, because some other people hate Pimsleur. There are others that criticize Pimsleur, not enough vocabulary, blah, blah, blah. But I love it as a beginner for me. Pimsleur is wonderful. I think I like it. It's all ear training. There's no reading. Um, it's I really like it. I find it very stimulating. I also like it's just short enough. It's not too long where my brain gets tired, but it's challenging enough. I kind of keeps my brain awake. So it's not the only thing I would say. Don't only do Pimsleur, but I quite like it at the beginner level. I quite like Pimsleur. So I do it. That's what I do. And I don't do Asimil because I don't like it. So you have to find this for yourself because we're all a little different. It's just like people ask me, what book should I read, AJ? Recommend a book. I can't really because I don't know what you like. Like, like I like nonfiction. I like business books. But if you hate business, I'm not. Go if I tell you read a business book, maybe you hate it. Maybe you're not interested. So for you, that's a bad choice. Um... Some people like romance. I don't, I don't like romance books. I don't like it at all. Don't like those kinds of books. Not interested. Boring for me. So, um, but maybe you love romance books. So you should choose the kind of books you like. So, Sarah, yes, you you, you've got to find the things that you, li you love and enjoy. If you love my podcast, listen to my podcast. That's one thing I'm trying to do with my podcast is make it interesting. Talk about interesting topics. Make it interesting for you. So it's not, that's why I don't just talk about grammar and language all the time because it's kind of boring after a while. I don't, you know, I wrote a whole book about that. Uh, there, I think most of you already have a good idea about what you need to do to learn English. So I don't want to talk about that topic constantly all the time because it gets really boring. <laughs> right? It's much more interesting to talk about fitness and health and philosophy and spirituality and travel and all of these great things are far more interesting in English. So the whole time you're listening to English and improving your English, but the topics are hopefully interesting to a lot of you. Right, now Vladislav mentions another one. Great software is Rosetta Stone as well. It uses words and phrases and pictures. Yes, yeah, some people like Rosetta Stone and some people don't. Personally, I don't actually. I actually don't like Rosetta Stone. I tried it, but I didn't like it. Um, but others like it. So it's not, there's not right or wrong. Like Vladislav, uh, sounds like he likes Rosetta Stone. Some people really do. So great, if, try it. And if you like it, use it. As I said, Pimsleur, a lot of people don't like Pimsleur. So, uh, but I do. I really like it. Like Moaz says, optimism is one quality more associated with success and happiness than any other. Indeed, that, that positive mindset is the starting point and the foundation. Okay, a couple more, and then we got to go. Andrea, how do I join your VIP program? Uh, EverlessEnglishClub.com. Go to that website there, and uh, you'll see a link to VIP. Click that. You'll get all the information about the price, what do you get, everything. EverlessEnglishClub.com. Yeah, cool. See, Kim Vick, Kim Vick says, as you might guess from my name, I'm a chemist, my nickname. Every day I listen to your lessons while I'm doing experiments. See, you can, some people, uh, some jobs, you can actually listen while you're at your work. And I read Goosebumps in the subway. Goosebumps is a series of books 
for uh, kids, like elementary school mostly. And uh, they're kind of uh, scary stories or thrillers, but not too scary because they're for kids, uh, but about monsters and things like that, a little bit scary. You know, it's a very good series of books if you like that kind of story. <sighs> yeah, Rawaz says, I'm disappointed every time I try to build a new habit. I can't do it for a short time, then I quit very soon. Because of this, my family and friends are bored with me. Okay, so I'm thinking um, this kind of connects to the Sarah's quest uh, question. Because um, I found this in my own life. If I try to use willpower, just pure discipline only, then it is indeed very difficult to start a new habit. But if the new activity, if you find a way to make it enjoyable so that you enjoy the process of doing it, you actually enjoy doing it, not just the goal later, but you enjoy doing it right now, it becomes quite easy. Why? Because anything enjoyable, you naturally want to do more, right? So again, if you enjoy reading, you don't really need motivation because you want to read because you enjoy it. If you enjoy physical exercise, and I do, well, I, like I don't need motivation to exercise. I don't need a motivation to go walking or jogging or rucking or something. I, I, I need, it, it's hard to stop me from doing it because it feels good. If I don't do it, I feel bad. So it's enjoyable for me. I, I, I like getting outdoors. I like moving my body. I like looking around. I like I, I use it for time for thinking or studying or other things. So um, it's, it's like it's it's doesn't really need I don't need motivation to do that because I love it because it's part of my life and I really enjoy it. Now, when I started doing the fasting, this is one of the, the big changes that happened. For me, I would mentioned yesterday that, uh, you know, maybe 10 years ago I tried fasting and it was just painful. It took so much effort to do it. Uh, I was just doing pure water fasting, plain water. And uh, I was, you know, miserable really after a few days. And so I, I really, I did, it did not become a habit because I did that and I, argh, with my willpower, I finished the fast. But then if I thought about doing another one soon, I'm like, oh, I don't want to do that again. That was terrible. But now what, what Cole Robinson's snake diet program did is that it taught me a way to fast that would not feel so bad, that would be more feel good, be more enjoyable using the salt water. The salt water makes a big difference, guys. It really makes a big difference. So when I start drinking the salt potassium water, then it's like, well, this isn't so bad. And actually, I'm kind of feeling good. I feel kind of good. And then I look at the scale and I see, oh, I'm, and I'm dropping weight. I'm feeling good. My Emotionally, I feel good. My mind feels better. Uh, my energy's fine. Um, and uh, I'm losing weight. So then it became a very easy habit to start. So a lot of times, if you're struggling with a new habit, you've got to find ways to make it more enjoyable uh, right now, right now, not in the future when you achieve the goal. Wally, what I like is eating donuts. I've got a problem. <laughs> okay. Oh, Mars Gim says, hi from Korea, not the north, by the way. Yeah, I figured. I don't think they have internet yet, free internet. Uh, I was struggling with speaking English. I came back to your videos. I found the piece. It really relaxed me. Always inspiring. Thank you. Yep, exactly. Thank you. <laughs> Tuan says, this is very nice. Sometimes my cheeks hurt because of smiling too much when listening to your lessons. That's very nice. That's sweet. Thanks. All right, guys, it's about time to go. We'll end with Merrick with a very nice comment as usual. Merrick says, our meetings and conversations are interesting. 
In my case, it's not even about learning or practicing a language, but about the valuable topics we are discussing here. Yes, amen, that's what it's about for me too. And that really is my goal. You know, it's been my goal with Effortless English from the very beginning, you know, way back in 2006, uh, was that I wanted all my students to be more focused on ideas and topics and to be so interested in the topics, so interested in the ideas that they actually just kind of would forget about English. They would forget they were listening to English because they would be so focused on the topics. And when, when that happens, then the English learning and improvement ha feels like it's happening automatically. Feels like it's happening effortlessly. That's where the name comes from. So thank you, Merrick, because that's uh, that is my indeed my purpose and goal as a teacher. All right, guys, that's all. Hope you enjoyed it. So again, Aesop's Fable, that was number seven. And that was look before you leap. Think ahead before you take a dangerous action. And uh, think ahead before you trust somebody you don't know. All right, as always, go to EffortlessEnglishClub.com. Join my VIP program at EffortlessEnglishClub.com. Back with another show soon. Lots of love to you. Commit, don't quit at EffortlessEnglishClub.com.